there is a point where invention turns into creation, and creation turns into worship. We used to build machines. Now, we're building something far more powerful. Something that might soon see us the way we once saw fire or gods. Our answer is we think of us being wizards, wizards that can create images out of nowhere, wizards that can communicate around the world instantaneously. What would we think of our children's children's children? The world of the future is a world similar to mythology, a world of the gods. Kaku paints a picture of the future where the divine isn't found in heaven. It's engineered in a lab. These aren't supernatural beings. They're super intelligent, superhuman, and inevitably superior. And it all begins the moment intelligence and machinery become one. To a being that can merge mind and machine, death becomes a bug to be patched, not a fate to be feared. Digital immortality, Kaku says, is already here in its most primitive form. And from that seed, the new gods will grow. There are two kinds of immortality. One is digital immortality, and one is organic immortality. Digital immortality is when you create a clone of yourself that is mechanical, that has basically many of your memories, thought patterns, and looks like you. And the first generation of these digital immortals has already existed. What we do is we create a, a image of yourself that moves and talks, and you talk to this image. And this image is access as a tape recorder that has interviewed you and got your entire biography. At first, these technologies will heal. A paralyzed soldier walking again. A lost sense of touch returned. But every cure hides potential for enhancement. Once we can fix the human body, we'll start to improve it. And that's when our children will become something else. This was done with William Shatner of Star Trek fame. For several days, he was interviewed about his life, his ideas, his thoughts, his history. And it was put into an image of him that will live forever. So this is digital immortality something which is attainable today, in fact, rather primitive today, but it's possible to attain digital immortality so that you can have a conversation with your great, 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 great grandkids about life in the 21st century. So we're talking about putting the, uh, putting the brain into a computer or a computer into a brain. And so the two become the same, basically. This is all possible, and it's been looked at. Of course, it would take centuries for us to be able to do this process, but it's possible. Imagine a civilization so advanced, its explorers don't travel in ships. They travel as data. Their minds beamed across the stars. Their bodies replaced by whatever form the destination allows. Immortality distributed across galaxies. Now let's take it to a thousand years. How could we then explore the universe a thousand years from now? I think it's possible that at that point, we'll be able to digitize ourselves, put our thinking process into software, put the software into a rocket, and shoot the rocket throughout the universe. Once the rocket lands on the moon, it then hooks up to an exoskeleton and thereby allowing you to control an exoskeleton on the moon. You can also shoot these exoskeletons throughout the universe and therefore be able to explore the universe mentally by shooting your consciousness throughout the universe. And yet, if our consciousness becomes code, if reality becomes simulation, how do we know it hasn't happened already? Kaku is often asked, are we living in a matrix? Okay, if you're a scientist, then predict the future. 
Tell me what the future is going to look like. Well, first of all, I don't know. But what I can say is I think that we can make educated guesses. Educated guesses because we know the trajectory of physics and chemistry. You see, our ancestors lived in a world of magic, a world of witchcraft. There were no rules. There was no equations, no principles to guide them. Today, we have the principles. We have the equations. We have the framework. That doesn't mean we can accurately predict the future, but we can make intelligent guesses. So, for example, computers. We would know that computers will be quantum mechanical. And as a consequence, they would be millions of times more powerful than what we have today. And therefore, artificial intelligence could become a, a reality. And with that power comes dominion. Kaku describes a hierarchy of civilizations, each step closer to omnipotence, planetary, stellar, galactic, each mastering not only their world, but the fabric of existence itself. Physicists have looked at outer space for guidance as to what alien technologies and civilizations may be like. One theory ranks them in terms of type 1, type 2, type 3. A type 1 civilization is a civilization that harnesses all planetary energy. Anything planetary, they control. They mine all the light that comes from the sun. They control earthquakes, volcanoes, anything on the planet Earth they control. That is type 1. Type 2 exhausts the power of a planet, and they exhaust now the power of the sun. They just don't get a suntan, they control the sun. The entire output of the sun is used in their machines. This is a type 2 civilization, and we see this in science fiction. Star Trek, the Federation of Planets, would be a type 2 civilization. Then there's type 3. A type 3 is galactic. They roam the galactic space lanes. They're able to play with black holes. And that would be Star Wars. Star Wars is a galactic civilization. That would be type three. But even gods can die. Kaku warns that every civilization on the path to divinity faces four possible apocalypses, each born from its own inventions. And one of them is the very thing that could create us. Well, one problem with civilizations is that they may have a tendency to self-destruct. There are basically four ways in which a type one civilization can self-destruct. You have nuclear weapons, you have germ warfare, you have global warming, and you have artificial intelligence. So there are four ways in which you could have planetary destruction of a type 1 civilization. For all the danger, Kaku remains optimistic. He believes progress has a direction, one that bends toward connection, not collapse. That every new technology, no matter how divine it seems, ultimately spreads power, not hoards it. And so in other words, I think progress has a direction. So I would disagree with some people who say that science has no direction, that science can be used to destroy the world, or science can be used to liberate, but it has no direction. I tend to disagree. I tend to think that science does have a direction, and the direction is toward democratization, toward sharing of the fruits of this technology, which did not happen in the past. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be ups and downs. That doesn't mean there won't be wars, skirmishes, and problems. But when you look at history, decade by decade, century by century, you realize that there is a direction to history. But even the gods of data are still bound by time. And time, as Einstein once said, is not a straight river. It bends, forks, and loops. And maybe, just maybe, can be reversed. What did you think about today's journey? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I read every single one. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss what's coming next. 
we've got more strange, unsettling, and fascinating stories from the universe headed your way. Until then, stay safe and stay curious.